Catalyst 2030 started life as a WhatsApp group among social entrepreneurs, connecting to envision real transformational change. Launched at the World Economic Forum in January 2020, it's grown into a global movement accelerating change to ensure the SDGs are reached by 2030. Fueled by passion, our 550 members working in 175 countries have collectively put in an amazing 50,000 volunteer hours, touching the lives of 2 billion people. And we're driven by values, to which we hold ourselves accountable. 2020 was a busy year, co-creating three reports with partners and producing one of our own. Inviting high-level guests to participate in the Catalyzing Change campaign, hosting fireside chats and expert hours, which will be continuing in 2021. To celebrate our achievements, together we placed our supporters in the limelight with the first Catalyst 2030 Awards for Systemic Change. With the blessing of the Dalai Lama, we celebrated finalists and winners in the following categories. Special recognition for our early supporters, individual philanthropists, donor organizations, philanthropic intermediaries, corporate organizations, by a multilateral organizations and four regional winners in the category of national governments. And now on to Catalyzing Change Week 2021. During this social entrepreneur-led event, we bring together diverse stakeholders in over 100 sessions to showcase their systems change efforts and the best practices that can accelerate our work in pursuit of the SDGs. Hi everyone, I hope everyone had a minute to settle in and watch that amazing video from Catalyst 2030. Um, my name is Tanushri, really happy to be here and really happy to welcome all of you um, to the session on the global flows of textile waste. I, I really hope everyone who is in the audience right now is safe and your family and everybody is safe and doing well. I'm really grateful that you are here for this session today in the middle of some pretty difficult times that we are facing globally. Um, but this is still, I think, even more so a very important conversation for us to be having at this time. So thank you for joining me. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit introduction about myself. Um, my name is Tanushri. As I said, I work with an organization called IntelliCap, which is a development consultancy based in India. IntelliCap has started an initiative called the Circular Apparel Innovation Factory, or CAIF, which is easier to remember. Um, and CAIF really has this ambitious mission to help the textile and the apparel industry in the global south move towards sustainable and circular models. Um, that means many different things, um, and we are running a lot of different programs addressing a lot of different issues uh, from plastic waste to gender inclusion um, and social equity. One of the issues that I'm personally extremely passionate about um, that we are tackling through a long-term program at CAIF is around textile waste. Um, this is an issue that some of you may be extremely familiar with and maybe some of you not so much. And so the goal of the session was really to share some learnings that we have done, that we have acquired over the past few years through a lot of research um, of the landscape of textile waste and what is happening when we throw textile away. And this could be clothes, but this could also be your curtains or your cushion covers. Uh, what happens when we throw textile away? Where does it go? And who's taking care of it for us? This is a much larger issue than I think even I realized before I started working in this space. And so we did a lot of research over the past few years to understand this problem. And we turned our findings into a short animated film um, and that's what we'd like to screen today. So you may have noticed that the session format is a film screening <clears throat> and we'll be, we'll be screening our short film, which is just under five minutes long. Um, and followed by that, I will be joined by a few experts who will be having a discussion with me and we'll be having a conversation essentially about what we see in the film. So I'm gonna let you watch that film for the next five minutes and then I'll see you at the other end. Textile waste is a huge problem. 
and our landfills and garbage dumps are full of our old and worn clothes, cutting scrap and more. But how does it get here and where has it been? Let's rewind. This is the common t-shirt. It's made in a garment manufacturing unit where bits and pieces of the fabric get discarded. These cuttings from many different such t-shirts get landfilled. This is known as pre-production waste. Sometimes the scraps are sold to a chindiwala or an independent waste worker. The chindiwala sells larger pieces to smaller traders and manufacturers who turn them into garments or rags, which after a slightly longer life end up right back in the landfill. Now the t-shirt itself goes to a retail store where you or I buy it, wear it and reuse it a few times. And after some wear and tear, this t-shirt too finds its way back to that very same landfill. These old and worn clothes are called post-consumer waste. Sometimes no one likes the t-shirt and no one buys it for a long time. And it's eventually sold to that same chindiwala from where it goes through its long journey right back to that landfill. This dead stock is known as post-production waste. And while all these three kinds of waste are living their lives and ending up in the landfill, outside this entire cycle sit a bunch of textile recyclers. They run large factories that regularly grind up waste back into the fiber, which gets turned into new clothes. And this cycle keeps repeating with nothing ever going to landfill. Seems like a perfect system, right? Except. Most of the waste they use isn't our t-shirts, it's t-shirts from other countries in the world. USA and Europe, for instance, discard their t-shirts too, but their waste gets shipped to us, sent all the way to India, most of which gets picked up by the recyclers and turned into new clothes, which are then put back on that ship and sold right back to those countries, while our clothes keep ending up in this landfill. Of course, some of them get picked up by upcycling organizations, some of them get sold in secondhand clothing markets before being discarded, but by and large, the third highest source of municipal waste in India is textile. So let's back up. In this entire map of textile waste in India, what's going wrong? Why are more and more clothes ending up in landfill? One. Chindiwalas operate at a really small scale and can't collect or aggregate waste in big enough quantities, so they can only sell it to other chindiwalas. The recyclers don't want them. 2. Once the waste leaves their manufacturing unit or their retail store, the brands have no idea where it goes. Which waste worker? Where does he go? Who does he sell it to? And how do they use it? No clue. 3. Brands account for up to 25% wastage in manufacturing. So despite all the effort and money that goes into creating garments, they don't mind simply tossing the excess. This waste becomes waste only because it's wasted. Looking at it as a raw material with value would bring it back into the chain and reduce the burden on our landfills. And four, all of the stakeholders across this entire value chain don't really work with each other. They just hand over the waste to the next person in the chain. Working collaboratively would mean designing a system that considers every stakeholder from the get-go. So, if this is the map of textile waste in India, how can we redraw it to be better and close the loop on this waste? This is a challenge for the entire ecosystem and no single organization or entity can solve it. If you are a brand, manufacturer, recycler, or solution provider, get in touch with us to help close the loop on textile waste in India. I'm seeing some messages already come in in the chat and there seem to be people from all over the world. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Deepa, hi. <laughs> Deepa, do you want to say a quick hi? Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. This is um, my name's Deepa. I'm from Catalyst 2030, and um, hopefully, I'm, that I'm hoping that a lot of you will want to join the new sustainable fashion IBG that we're going to launch off the back of this week. So I'll pop my um, details in the chat. So please do get in touch.
Thanks. Thanks, Deepa. Um, it's really amazing to see that there are so many different initiatives now to address the issue of sustainability in the fashion industry. This is really a problem that is becoming recognized more and more globally. Um, but I think one of the things that we really wanted to bring out with this film, although the film was about India in particular, because this is where our research is, uh, the, the issue of the lack of sustainability in the fashion industry and the issue of textile waste in particular seems to sort of unfairly affect countries in the global south. And so I'm really happy to be joined by three amazing speakers, three very inspiring women who I'm really happy that we are working with at CIF also. If I could request all three of you to please switch your videos on. Um, and these are three women who are working in three different countries in the global south. And we just wanted to have a little bit of a conversation about what we just watched. Um, and to perhaps help everybody understand what this issue of textile waste really is all about. Um, and so I'm just gonna quickly introduce you and then over to each of you to talk a little bit more about the amazing work that you're doing. Um, we have Wilma, Wilma Rodriguez, who is the founder of Sahas Zero Waste, an organization based in India that works with solid waste management. Uh, Liz, Elizabeth, who works with secondhand clothing sellers in Ghana and Anne, who is the founder of Reverse Resources that works extensively with manufacturers, textile manufacturers in Bangladesh. And some of the images that you're seeing being shared right now, well, we had a little animation, but we really wanted to show you what this problem really looks like on ground. Um, and these are images that were not Googled by us. They're all images taken by these three women and their organizations. Um, so just wanted to give you a re real sense of what this looks like. Welcome all three of you. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. So if I could, uh, if I could just kind of hand over and ask each of you to kind of speak a little bit about yourself and your organizations. Um, we saw in the video that there are a number of different challenges and a number of different reasons why textile waste is a problem. Um, and I wondered if I could ask each of you to speak about which kind of challenge area you are tackling and what your solution is for that. So perhaps Anne, I could start with you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. And, and thank you for the introduction. The video that you showed, I think, explains super well the whole um, problem with the textile waste. And uh, I'm the founder and the CEO of Reverse Resources. We have been um, running a software platform company for six years. And the video explains quite exactly what we're trying to capture as a whole picture with data. Uh, about how textile waste is, how, where is it uh, generated, where is it going through the waste man uh, waste workers, we call them waste handlers, and and how can it uh, reach, how does it reach right, recycling right now, and how can we improve these material flows? And um, Rios Resources is a, a platform, a digital tool for the whole chain of custody, or the supply chain to actually map and steer these waste flows. Um, we have been mostly focusing on industrial waste streams, uh, industrial meaning the main focus has been on cutting scraps, leaving the garment factories, but we are, um, as our main client is large brands or who wants to work together with their factories to get the waste uh, sorted and segregated already in the, in, uh, in the cut process. And, and make it accessible and really cost, cost efficiently accessible for the recycling partners. Um, we, we, are, we're, we are building the tool that helps to do this mapping, steering and tracing of the waste flows for the large brands. We also are interested to understand how can we merge our data set of the industrial waste together with the other material flows so that that picture and that information can, can be complete because the, the data really is missing. There is no actual statistics available for the fashion industry to even close this um, loop of, uh, of their waste back to, back to production. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think, Anne, you're working more at the source where a lot of industrial waste comes from, which is the garment manufacturing units. And that's where a lot of industrial waste begins. Um, and I guess, Wilma, you kind of work at the other end of the spectrum, which is where a lot of this waste ends up, and you work really hands-on on ground with, with waste handlers and waste workers. Um, and so could you tell us a little bit about your work in this space? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. So Saha Zero Waste um, is an organization that works very much at the, you know, at the ground, we work with waste generators and we work to ensure that all the waste, you know, goes to a destination. And actually, we are looking at processes around circular economy. So whilst we have worked a lot with municipal solid waste in the form of wet waste, where there is a solution now in terms of composting, in terms of biogas, and then all your kinds of dry waste, which is paper, plastic, metal, glass. Uh, it's been an intensive 20 years of working on the ground. And you know, at this point, we've made some kind of progress with all of these kinds of waste streams. We have at least regulations now for plastic waste, uh, for the municipal solid waste. But somehow textile waste has kind of been elusive. Yeah, there's been nobody talking about textile waste and the problem has definitely been growing. Fast fashion has been, you know, a large, has contributed significantly to that. And India has, is very proud in the fact that it generates so much of livelihood, which people producing apparel, garments, et cetera, for the world. And this, you know, we know has contributed largely to the problem. So having worked on the ground with all of these other kinds of waste in the last two years, we have put significant effort to actually tracing and making sure now we have proper systems to collect and recycle textile waste, both at pre-consumer and post-consumer. Uh, uh, levels. And at both of these levels, we have really huge problems. At pre-consumer levels, you have a system which is really unfair because you have large quantities of good quality textile fabric going to upcycling, going to recycling. But then in that whole collection process, you have an informal sector where the, it's not a livelihood that we create, but an exploitation, a forced kind of system, because people are expected, the informal sector is expected to buy from the big manufacturers this waste. And then at the post-production or the post-consumer phase, we have a similar problem. The, the fabrics or the apparel is soiled. Uh, there is no proper end destination for it. There is very little recycling. And yet you have brands, you know, kind of through their extensive marketing exercises, urging consumers to buy more just so that their own business models can be viable. So, you know, we are really looking now to work more intensively, we've kind of scraped a little bit the surface in putting a system in place, but we definitely have to deep dive and make sure that far, far more efforts, first with regulation, which we don't have currently for textile waste, and then the responsibility of generators in terms of the consumers and definitely the brands. So this is what we do and you know, happy to have this conversation with all of you. Thank you so much, Wilma. I saw Liz nodding while you were talking about the issue of post-consumer waste, um, because Liz, that's what you work with uh, in Ghana. So could you tell us a little bit about the Or Foundation? I think I missed mentioning the name of your organization, but please tell us a bit about your work. Yeah, thank you so much. I was, yeah, everything that Wilma was saying, I was very much in tune with, so thank you. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, first of all, thank you for that film. I think it does an amazing job of sort of exposing the absurdity of the situation of this waste crisis on so many levels. And my organization, the Or Foundation, we're basically, we're based both in the United States and in Ghana. And we've been working between these countries for over a decade. And so we're really looking at this issue of post-consumer waste that's being exported to the global south, again, specifically to Ghana through the global secondhand clothing trade. And I think um, there's so many misconceptions around secondhand clothing. So I'll contextualize that a little bit. And um, basically we work with the Continental ecosystem in Accra, Ghana, which is the largest used clothing market in West Africa and probably the largest in the world. So Continental sees 15 million garments a week. Uh, and this is just one of several secondhand markets in Ghana, which has a national population of 30 million people. So 15 million garments a week, 30 million people. You can obviously see where this is going. Um, but Contamanto itself, you know, I think there's there's many important ways to look at this. And 
Contamanto itself is a model of sustainability, right? It recirculates 25 million garments every week, which is more clothing than any resale platform in the global north. And this is possible very much because of some of the things that are mentioned in the film. It's possible because of the distributed and collectivist sort of nature of the market, because of the indigenous sustainability logic that people shop with and also make with, and because there's 30,000 people in this market who are using their skill set to upcycle all of this excess that's coming from the global north. I mean, it is very much what the global north is talking about wanting to see in all of their retail environments. Oh. But still, you know, I think when people donate their clothes in the global north, they often think that everything will find a home. Um, but there's no such retail utopia, right, as, as we all know. So just as brands in the global north intentionally overproduce by up to 40%, basically my organization has found that of the 15 million garments that are coming through Continent, so 40% leaves as waste. And the impact, you know, is, is I mean, it's, it's devastating is an understatement. You know, it's led the only landfill that Accra has to explode. Um, which, you know, I'm not exaggerating when I say explode. Um, most of this clothing is ending up in the ocean. You know, people in the global north, I think we're rightfully concerned about microfiber pollution from our wash, but I literally am seeing millions of garments washing up on the shore and coating the sea floor, which not only has an environmental impact, but very much is impacting, you know, artisanal fishing communities. And the labor itself is also of concern, right? Retailers are basically going into debt. There's young women who are carrying this clothing who are, again, in debt slavery mm -hmm. and facing you know, sexual violence as part of that. Um, and the work that they do is backbreaking and often fatal. They carry these bales that are 120 to 200 pounds on their heads, and a lot of them die because their necks break under the weight of you know, this clothing. And I think, again, the sort of violent absurdity of that is that a lot of this clothing was never even worn. <laughs> a lot of this clothing was, or maybe it was worn once. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think for us, we're at this stage of, of not only trying to tackle this crisis from a material level, but helping people to understand that the secondhand clothing trade is a supply chain. You know, it is, it is not viewed in that way. We do not ask the same questions about it that we ask about the so-called firsthand supply chain. Mm -hmm. And if we want to talk about circularity, we want to talk about material solutions. We can't have that conversation if we aren't looking at the labor that already exists, you know, within um, the supply chain. Yeah. So yeah, that's a lot of the work that we do. Wow. I feel like we could stop right there. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was amazing. Thank you, all three of you. Uh, I think what's really coming out here is, first of all, we're talking about three very different countries. We're talking about India, Bangladesh, Ghana, and I'm sure there are other countries that are facing this burden of textile waste. Um, but we're such different countries facing pretty much exactly the same issues. And, and, and you know, the three countries we're talking about as well as others kind of are referred to collectively as the global South. Um, and Wilma, as you rightly said, you know, a lot of countries in India, for instance, is a very large producer of textile and garments and apparel. And so we're creating our own waste domestically um, and we're exporting all of that out. We're also now becoming a very large consumer of clothing and apparel. And so we almost have this double burden. Um, and, this, and then Liz, as you said, clothes that are worn in other countries are just kind of donated to people in the global South. And so I feel like there's a lot of like good intention behind what's happening like somebody donates a piece of clothing with the right intention right but somewhere this entire thing is going wrong and somehow that burden is ending up on countries in the global south and if i could just get some responses from you know really any of you on what you feel about this place that the global south is occupying in this large and complicated supply chain yeah so the, so we are bearing that burden um, and I think um, intentions, um, you know, uh, I think we've got to kind of say that I think there's enough known now to, to be able to call out that it's not always good intentions. Uh, and we really need to therefore probe, push, nudge, you know, do what it takes to make sure that now we have both consumers and brands paying appropriately investing appropriately, 
for infrastructure uh, so that this, uh, this burden is, is now uh, not shared by the environment and not shared by the people uh, working, um, you know, to, to kind of uh, make things happen with no uh, support at all. So I think let's, you know, we really need now some tough talking and uh, uh, we're talking about just a few years from now, you know, meeting all those SDG goals. Uh, so really we're running out of time and we're seeing the effect of our lethargy. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I really feel things have to move much, much faster than they have been in the past. Yeah, because, because we talk about the global south, but it's not just the countries and the economies overall. It is the poorest people at the bottom of the pyramid who are actually bearing this burden. And I know all three of you work with kind of different communities of these people. Um, and so, Anne, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your experience of working with garment manufacturers and waste handlers that you work with in Bangladesh um, and what this sort of scale of this problem is having on their livelihoods and their lives. Um, first of all, I, I, I feel like um, um, the whole circular economy is very, very complex because it's uh, when we come from linear economy, every organization is used to think in our own, my own boundaries. It's not a common habit to think in systems. And, and one of the, the biggest struggle for the uh, waste topic is to like, where, where can we uh, like hook in this um, and how, how can we make the different uh, individual participants understand how their actions are reflect um, influencing others in the system and how can we incentivize to do the right thing yeah. so this is one of the core um, struggles that uh, or and also core values that rivers resources has been building to identify these incentives and um, translate the situation uh, to the different stakeholders in a new way. And, and this is the, the biggest job for us in, in Bangladesh as well, to, to explain to the factories why segregating the waste at source is meaningful for themselves. Where, while for them, the, the meaning may be, may be small, but for the whole industry, it's huge. Um, same with the uh, waste workers, the, the traders, uh, waste handlers. Um, there is a lot of informal business in informal interests playing around it's 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 normally this sector has never been formal before and um i know anne is having a little trouble with her internet connection i'm not sure if i can just jump in here and um you know uh question this incentive uh, yeah. that we've heard in all of these you know years and i think that is our biggest challenge why should brands producers etc be incentivized to do the right thing i think we need to change that completely when we are talking now a different economy different structure moving away from capitalist thinking degrowth all of these are now exciting new times to be in these are 21st century thinking and so therefore let's throw out incentives yeah because we want people to be benefited we want environment to be benefited is that the incentive or is it still just going to be how much cash is that producer going to get so i i feel that should be our first you know we should look at it very closely. That would be a very, very beautiful world to live in. But I feel like Anne wants to say something about that. And uh, I know you're having a little bit of an issue with your internet. So if you want to switch off your video, please feel free. That would make it better. OK, I don't think it's going to help. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, what I wanted to argue back is that, uh, yes, it would be beautiful to not think in capitalist uh, terms, and I would love it as well. But um, realistically, if we want to change the hu huge industry, we have to find the business case. We just have to do that. And what, I'm, what we have seen that is that there is a huge business opportunity wow. in doing things in a circular way. There, it, it is huge. It is just that it has never done before, been done before. And if you do something for the first time, then this trial and error and everything, this drives up the cost and it's not instantly cost efficient. Mm -hmm. It's like solar panels. We had solar panels for ages. 
but only once they be became cheap enough, this becomes became like a mass stream. This is what oh. ha is happening in circular textiles as well. We we have a lot of evidence by now that the, the whole circulation, not just one circulation, but repeated circulation, can be done in a cheaper and more com uh, cost competitive way than linear economy. It's just that the shift over takes time because you have to convince the existing players, you have to raise new players and like really overwrite the current system. Yeah, so circularity uh, does make business sense. It does. Liz, your, Liz, your response. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I absolutely hear all of that, but I also think there's always going to be materials that there isn't a market for, just as there are people for whom there's no market solution coming. And those are a lot of the people that I work with. And I think we're already seeing this issue with circularity in the global north, where you have more resale platforms that, again, are less impactful than Consumanto, but you have more resale platforms. You have new technologies that are kind of skimming, they're picking off what they can profit from out of this waste stream. And the stuff that they can't capitalize off of is always going to end up in places like Contamanto, where people mm -hmm. there have to deal with it, where their waste management system has to deal with it. So I think I totally agree in terms of of these solutions, but also we do need to we do need to talk about justice. We need to talk about who's going to clean up the mess that's already been made, and how are we going to ensure that this is inclusive? Yeah, yeah. And please go ahead. I, I do agree that it, it needs to be justice and we need to clean up the mess, uh, not arguing back there, but I also wanted to make a point that um, at the moment when, when we are looking at uh, the, the information and the situation in silos uh, and we don't have a complete big picture, we don't have statistics, everybody knows my problem and the problem is big. Um, we can't really solve it either if we don't have that overall, or overall uh, um, overview. What we have seen, uh, for example, uh, through our research and, and uh, the material tracking and waste mapping, we've understood that there is like the problem that exists in, in Europe, for example, that it does not exist in, uh, in Asia and the other way around. And it's, it's all about um, the exact location of your problem your access to the market insight and being able to connect the dots. And a lot of problems could be solved uh, this way. So I, I do think that one of the key uh, drivers of, of really solving this problem is creating uh, statistics and digitalization of the material flows. And then we can actually look at the bigger picture altogether. Oh. Go ahead, Rosie. Yeah, so when we talk of business and viability, so how much is people and planet embedded in our business plans? Yeah, and today that if you're looking at ESG, for instance, you know, which is now coming up as businesses having to report on their ESG. So will that not change things? And uh, so, so I think that is, so we again, people, planet, uh, externalities of your business have to be part of your business plan today and maybe you'll you'll have profitability that will be um you know a slimmer bottom line uh, mm -hmm. in your uh, in, in your in your in your books but finally that what we are looking at is social justice and environment change so if that becomes a priority maybe we will sell less garments or less apparel we will use reuse secondhand more but we will achieve what we want to achieve in terms of SDGs. So can we embrace that thinking first collectively and then say, look, this has to happen in the 21st century. We cannot be constantly apologizing and saying, look, how will we do it? We just have to do it. And we have brands today who are the industry today who are saying, yes, we will do it. So let's put them on the mat and make them do it. And when you say we, when you say we need to do it, I understand it's the brands are the ones producing the clothing, or rather, it's the 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 name on the on the garment is of the brand, and so it feels like the brand is the custodian and the owner of this piece of clothing, even after it has been sold and resold to other people. There is still a sense that the brand is still needs to be responsible for what happens to this. Is that the right way of looking at it, or who owns who owns this garment? 
once it is changed multiple hands? And I guess, Liz, it's, it, that's a good question for you to kind of answer since you work with, with secondhand clothing, right? So who owns this piece of waste and therefore who should be responsible for it? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's a tricky one because I think ownership is a question of who takes responsibility, but also who can profit from it. And for me, a lot of the brands that are producing the waste are invested in disposability and they're invested in disposability because they have treated people and resources as if they're disposable, meaning that they're the only actor within this life cycle of the product that actually hasn't paid the true cost of the thing. So for me, I don't see why they should be the ones that get to profit from it. I think if brands are going to be taking this waste back and recycling it and putting it back in their system, then we need to talk about profit sharing models. We need to talk about redistributing the value that they're recapturing back through their value chain. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that's very much um, sort of the questions that I'm thinking about, but for the clothing that's ending up in Ghana, I think that that should, the responsibility of sort of funding circular economy initiatives should come from the global north um, because they have chosen to sort of use it as a dumping ground. But I think that the opportunities um, for infrastructure and for creating localized circular economy solutions that those again should lie with the folks in Kansamansa themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we have a good precedent in terms of extended producer responsibility that yeah. is applicable for plastic and electronic waste. So yeah. we already have electronic waste now across the world. There are responsibilities put on where all the stakeholders, the consumers, uh, as well as the brands, producers, everybody. So what is stopping us to bring that into the textile space? Yeah, what is stopping? Well, and I think, no, nothing. But also with those with EPR, it needs to be global in perspective. Again, because France is the only country that has EPR for textiles. It's been since 2007. And even though they're collecting that money, even though that money is supposed to go to waste management, 40% of the clothing they've collected has gone to the continent of Africa and not a single cent of that money has gone with it to help manage the waste. And so if we're going to develop these EPR schemes Again, they need to be holistic. They need to really be looking at, as Anne said, like we really need to understand the current flow of this material so that these mm -hmm. policies can be made with that in mind, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, and, and say, say India or Bangladesh or Ghana, one of these countries were to have an EPR law. I mean, policy and regulation is kind of the final you know, sort of gauntlet, right? When that happens is when the brands pay attention, the manufacturers pay attention, then they have to, they have to do something about it. So if that were to happen, do you think that would solve the problem as it were from your perspective? So would there be, for instance, in terms of digitization or data access, you know, the, these challenges that you're working with, do you think EPR would solve the problem? No. Mm. <laughs> The, the thing is that the, it's, uh, EPR still um, follows the logic of uh, like, like I'm not an expert on EPR, but as as much as I understand, then uh, it, it may help uh, till uh, on the post consumer end to the point that uh, if, if large brands are working with certain uh, collectors and sorters of the waste, that they make sure that this waste is not, um, it is really collected and it really is uh, sold forward or put forward, but it doesn't really help to, to trace it, where it, like oh. to take responsibility of like, did it actually end up in a cer certain supply chain or, or value chain? And oh. on the other end, on the industrial waste side, when we, um, many of these very largest uh, brands aren't buying the fabric they aren't buying the, the previous stages of that supply chain. They are buying the garment, like the only, the last end mile product that comes out of the supply chain. And then we are looking at uh, waste being generated throughout the whole supply chain before that. Um, Elizabeth, you said before that 40% of post-consumer, 40% of garments put on, on the market never even get to be used. On the industrial side, 
we we ourselves have uh, proven that it's um, it's actually it gathers up 50% of the fiber that enters the supply chain that actually is not even reaching the product. So there is a, the whole supply chain is long, it's it's fractured, and there are so many steps on the way that are creating waste. And there is like EPR doesn't reach throughout this extended supply chains still. Yeah. And so I guess your argument is absolutely correct. And we're talking about a circular economy. We're not talking about a model for a single organization. It is an economy. Everyone is connected to everyone. And we really need that very holistic view. Um, I completely understand each of your perspectives, you know, and we, we speak about social justice because, you know, Liz and Wilma, you work on that end of the spectrum and Anne speaks about a business case because she works on that end of the spectrum, but it's really not about either or, it seems to be about both and, you know, we need, we need all of this and all of you doing the amazing work that you're doing to collectively solve the problem. Um, I wanna stop talking and bring in a few questions because we've had a lot of comments come in in the chat box and I just wanna like read a few of them. Um, and actually, if anyone in the audience would like to just unmute yourself and just, you know, if you have a comment or a question, if you'd like to just unmute yourself and speak, that would be fantastic. Or I can be your mouthpiece. Um, ben, who is helping me from Catalyst with Tech, are people able to unmute themselves if they want to? Yes, they are. Yep. Okay, brilliant. Would anyone like to just come on video and just chat with us for a bit? Show yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see who you are. Uh, Join us. But in the meantime, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this and pick up some of the questions that have come in. Uh, I think very early on, somebody said... Yes. Karan's got his hand up. Ooh, hi, Karan. Hi, everyone. Uh, so nice to see you guys here. Um, I have a question, and this is really around the conversation that you were just having on policy and EPR, um, which are more sort of accountability mechanisms for like corporates who create the issues. Um, I'm wondering what if it's a question of actually creating sort of markets that are regulated, looking at waste, not as waste, but waste as a material. Agriculture has a market that has economic value, sort of materials like textiles do as well. Like, what about trying regulation or advocacy efforts and moving towards that space? Have you tried that? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I could take that. So, um, so it is, um, it's definitely, um, you can do this for, uh, uh, for textiles or fabrics or materials where there is um, uh, an end buyer uh, for uh, you know, whatever waste is generated. But really the question also comes on large volumes of waste, pre-consumer, post-consumer, which does not have any value. For instance, today you have a lot of fabrics which are blends, um, polyester, you know, different types of plastic in, in that fabric, uh, plastic, cotton, all of it mixed. And um, so those fabrics become very difficult to recycle. Those fabrics, uh, unless there is considerable investment put into those into that recycling, uh, you know, there is a problem that we have on hand. So, so really, the reason we we need some kind of policy, uh, definitely, and I think that's that should come up sooner um, with both government and consumers and industry perhaps talking together, but um, we need accountability uh, for uh, this kind of waste that comes out. Uh, with e-waste with e also, we've had similar discussions over the last 15 years, and today the complexity of electronic waste with so many different types of uh, products, different types of materials, we are coming into some sense of making it happen. Uh, we need to have a far shorter a turnaround for textiles. We don't need 15 years now to get into a solution. We need to do it in the next few years. But at least let's have that conversation. What should be the regulation and how seriously will that regulation move to implementation? Because regulation alone we have seen does not happen, especially in places like India. We have very good regulations, but they don't get implemented on the ground simply because people start looking for ways in which to uh, circumvent the legislation, but that's where uh, complete 
you know, all, all um, stakeholders coming together is very important. Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder if there needs to be a little bit more awareness about how much plastic there is in textile waste. So there is a lot of EPR and laws for plastic, but not for the plastic in textile. Maybe that's a good place to start. I know Anne, you wanted to say absolutely. something. Then, Liz. I, I wanted to uh, give a, a second perspective here that what, what we do, we're doing with reverse resources is that uh, um, since the very beginning, we have, we have been aware that regulation and policy push is really long way to get in uh, in there to really change anything. So this is why um, we uh, recently, beginning of the year, launched uh, the Circle of Fashion Partnership together with uh, uh, Global Fashion Agenda and BGMEA in Bangladesh, uh, starting in Bangladesh, where we now have uh, 13 uh, largest brands on board who are coming together and making a commitment where they, as like with 13 brands, they are representing the um, majority of the buying power in the market. And when they come together and decide something together, their, um, their word is stronger than policy. And, and this is where it is kind of a policy instrument that we are now suggesting that factories should start segregating their waste because it's the smallest, easiest step that is necessary to enable better circulation of uh, materials. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be policy and regulation by the government or public sector. It, it can be um, like a joint practice industry to actually make a change happen. Yeah, and I guess that was Wilma's point as well, you know, that will is okay, the intent and talk has been there, but when you have that will and you actually start taking action, um, mm -hmm. and especially when the brands and the private sector gets involved because they are, they do have the loudest mm -hmm. voice and the deepest pockets, right? So while the issue might exist across the supply mm -hmm. chain, brands really need to perhaps take that responsibility for, for where all of this is ending up. Um, I'm looking at a few more questions and, and this is one that I have really wondered about also. We, I feel like when we talk about textile waste, um, we talk a lot, we, we primarily mean industrial waste, we mean cutting waste. Um, and I wonder if that is a less wicked problem than post-consumer waste or worn clothes, um, because worn clothes are completely disaggregated, coming out from millions of households across large geographies. Um, and so somebody has asked a question here about how post-consumer waste is actually really difficult to track. So even if we have the data on the production and the manufacturing, how do we actually track post-consumer waste and what are some solution directions that entrepreneurs, brands, and governments perhaps should be looking at to address the other end of the issue? Liz, would you like to comment on that? Sure. First, I, I do want to bring up, you, you brought up plastics. And I think that's also a really important question when we're talking about regulation or talking about accountability mechanisms, because we know that very little of the plastic that exists is actually recyclable. So for me, it's also a question of the circular economy talks about nutrients, but we can't make nutrients out of poison. So at what point are we going to look at the technologies that, that we do have for recycling textiles and demand that people not make things that cannot be recyclable, right? I mean, I think we just need to have an end point in mind for when we have these innovations, when we have these recycling and decomposition technologies available, when are we going to require that brands are not producing anything that can't go within that system? Yeah. Um, to your question about post-consumer waste, it's absolutely, it's a huge problem. It's one of the biggest problems that we face um, because Again, going back, going back to production, the secondhand clothing trade post-consumer waste is not seen as a supply chain. There is zero transparency, no traceability, and absolutely no accountability. I mean, there is, and again, this feeds into all of the myths around it being charity, around it being quote unquote recycling. So, I mean, we need to build in traceability mechanisms. And I think there's a lot of interesting work being done with IoT technology and you know, ways, again, for us to build in that traceability into the garments itself. But I, again, I also think a lot about who is that technology serving, who 
you know, is that technology going to trigger um, consumers to always be giving those resources back to brands or is it going to enter the public domain? Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think for me, it's just around having more regulation around this trade in general. And it's, it's no small feat because there's a lot of corruption on both ends, both from the exporting side and the importing side. You know, even just in doing our research, the research that we have done, um, I mean, we're seen as experts on the secondhand clothing trade because there is no comparable research. And I understand why it's very difficult to do. You cannot rely on the data that exists on the internet. You have to hand count what is coming into this market because again, there's a lot coming in that is, is not accounted for through official means. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I don't know that I have a solution for it. I am very interested in how IoT will be used um, for traceability and then how that feeds into, again, EPR policies, wow. but it's a, it's a huge issue. Yeah, so we have to first be aware of what is this waste that we're producing, how much of it is there. Um, and I guess, Anne, that was your point about digitization and data, and that has to be the starting point. We first need to know what we're talking about. Um, and then we can start making informed decisions. Um, we are we are almost at time. I wish we could we could speak longer. I wish this could be. There's so many more things that I would love to talk with you about. But um, I'm really glad that you came and and that everyone here is here. Thank you so much. Thank you to Catalyst for for the opportunity to have this conversation. Thank you all three of you. Um, I guess I would just want to give like maybe a minute or like just 30 seconds because we're on this amazing platform of Catalyst. Uh, which is a part of the WEF Alliance. We have this amazing community of really powerful people around the world who are in a position to do something. So just very quickly, perhaps in 30 seconds, each of you, if there was one thing you could ask the WEF and the Catalyst community to kind of do starting today, what would that be in a sentence? Anne? Sorry, you mean, uh, I, I couldn't hear the end of it. Sorry, is there is there like an ask to the Catalyst community that has joined us today from around the world? If there's one thing that people can start doing today or organizations, funders, entrepreneurs, mm. um, just 30 seconds, what would be your one ask? My one ask would be that um, on top of uh, seeing the benefits of your own organization or, or your own action or the value for yourself, try to always analyze the role in the bigger system and, and be understand where you are in that circular uh, community so that uh, the benefit is shared. Um, and I think this is what helps to solve this wicked problem that we have. See the bigger picture. Wilma, one ask. My one ask would be to investors who are now moving out of investing in, in oil and fossil fuels to come into investing into circular economy systems. Yes, absolutely. Liz. Love that. <laughs> I would build on that to just say that when it comes to investment, we need to prioritize the global south, like simply, right? This is not only because this is where the mess has been made and this is where the injustice is, but also because many countries in the global south, including Ghana, haven't actually built the infrastructure for the linear economy. They don't have, you know, they have not invested in that. So there's an opportunity to completely leapfrog that phase and to go straight to a circular economy. Absolutely. Um, and if I could make my little pitch at the end of that amazing discussion, um, these are exactly the kind of issues that my organization is trying to solve. We are trying to look at it from a bigger picture perspective. You know, what does this economy look like? How does every piece fit into this? And how can these pieces work better together? Um, I'm gonna ask my colleague Trina to paste a link of, um, it's a little Google form, we are building a multi-stakeholder, multi-year program to address the issue of textile waste, starting in India and then in the Global South overall. Um, the three organizations and the three women here, I'm very glad are, are partners of ours already in this program and I feel so fortunate, but we'd love to hear from others who are working in this space um, and want to join us. So please do click on that link that Gina has just shared. Um, and I think that's time for us. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for being here and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. That was right. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.